I hope you brought it today. You're going to need it. And uh, I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans and the 10th chapter. Um, you remember last week, I hope you were here last week. If you were not here last week, uh, you don't hear me say this very often, but if you weren't here last week, uh, I'd encourage you to get the CD. Now, it can't capture uh, the way that God moved among us last week, but uh, the message is still there, and I, I'm convinced needs to be heard. Uh, powerful, powerful move of the Holy Spirit last Sunday, and uh, it, it, it's, the title of the message was, uh, It Is Well. And uh, it was an amazing way that God just really brought us together as one and then poured himself into us. So um, thank God for you and your faithfulness. Last Sunday was kind of unique. I, I woke up uh, like four o'clock in the morning the week before and he told me exactly, God told me exactly what he wanted me to preach. And uh, so he did the same thing this week, except I didn't want to preach it. Uh, I wanted to do something different. And I argued with God for several days. Um, and I just want you to know you don't win those arguments. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? You don't win when you argue with God. Uh, today uh, is uh, the first of the next five Sundays that we're going to be looking at the values of First Baptist. Now, for you newbies that are with us, uh, every January, I preach on the five values of First Baptist Indian Trail. Now, those of you that have been with me for a few years, you know what those values are. And uh, if you want to say them out loud as I do, that, that'd be great. If you don't, that's all right, too. But we look, first of all, at focused outreach and then biblical truth and then Christ-centered worship, intentional care, and then transform lives. Now, I purposefully waited until the second Sunday in January to begin so that it would uh, coincide with what we've got going on next Sunday with Answers in Genesis with Ken Ham. And uh, I hope and pray that all of you will be faithful. Bring somebody with you. It's going to be a powerful Sunday morning. It will help you to be able to defend your faith as well as uh, be able to help you to become a more effective witness as we look at biblical truth next Sunday in Answers in Genesis. So uh, all of you be faithful and bring someone with you the next Lord's Day. Now, the Jews had rejected God, but thankfully he didn't reject the Jew. Verse 13 is probably the most beautiful universal verse on salvation ever recorded in the Bible. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, Paul now is uh, assuming an imaginary Jewish debater. Now, if you miss that, then you're going to miss the sermon. And you're not going to be able to understand this passage of Scripture. So get it in your mind, get it in your head. Paul is uh, counteracting a imaginary Jewish debater. And he's answering the objections that that debater has in a powerful way. Now the debate is like this. The Jew says to Paul that God wants them to be saved, but they're not saved. So if God wants them to be saved and they're not saved, then it must be God's fault. Paul is responding to that. There are, beginning in verse 14 and through the rest of the chapter, there are four major arguments uh, that arise out of that passage. And what Paul wants to do is to shoot down those arguments. And I'm convinced with all of my heart, it is a great application for the 21st century. So let's stand together and begin reading in verse number 14 of the book of Romans, the 10th chapter. Romans chapter 10 and uh, beginning in verse 14. Watch this with me, with me. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying, and that word gainsaying means contrary people. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, once again, I pray that you would uh, speak through your servant that is willing today to be a tool and an instrument of your grace and evangelism. Lord, I pray that uh, somehow, some way, uh, this ministry could catch the vision of what this passage is talking about and how we can be a more effective witness for you and how we could carry this message across our world. And Lord, thank you that you have entrusted to us this task. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, please be seated. Now I believe that if you'll hang with me a little bit, it gets a little bit detailed and God knows I'm not a detailed person, but I believe if you'll hang with me for a few minutes, you will enjoy this debate that Paul is having. Now, the first thing I want you to see with me this morning is the objection of the missing messenger. The objection of the missing messenger. Uh, this uh, debater says to Paul, uh, Paul, verse 13 is powerful, it's well and it's good, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But Paul, how can we call on somebody that we've never believed? And uh, how can we believe if we've never heard of him? And how can we hear about him if we don't have a preacher? And how can there be a preacher if God hasn't sent one? Now, these are all pretty good questions. And Paul is adequate to deal with. Now, the debater thinks that he has Paul on the horns of a dilemma. Uh, but Paul is up to this task. And he is certainly qualified to answer the questions. Now, Paul is amazing how he answers these questions. And he turns to the book of Isaiah time and time again uh, in this debate in the 51st chapter. He's starting out in reminding the nation of Israel how that uh, when the nation of Israel was uh, in Babylonian captivity, that God sent messengers to let them know that they had been released from that captivity, that they had been set free from the bondage, from uh, the inhibitions that, that they had imposed uh, on them. And uh, God, uh, Paul is saying just the same as God sent messengers to the Jews that were in captivity to Babylonia, he has also sent you messengers. And then in verse 14, uh, he, he's just really dealing with that. In verse 15, how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, any way you slice it, uh, any way you look at this, uh, any way you think about it, you and I are going to have a hard time understanding the term beautiful feet. Anything beautiful about feet? It's almost like an oxymoron, isn't it? Hmm? You guys that are sitting out here, I wonder how many of you, when you first laid eyes on the woman that became your wife, how many of you were attracted to her, first of all, by her beautiful feet? You look down at her feet and you said, oh my, I've never seen such toes in my born days. 
and the arch of your foot is just so curvy. And that heel, mm, how smooth that it is. I, I doubt very seriously if any of you were ever attracted to your mate as a result of their feet. Uh, nothing beautiful about feet. Matter of fact, what we wind up doing is covering them up with socks and if that's not enough, we put a shoe on it to make sure that it's covered up. So what in the world does the Bible mean when he's talking about how beautiful are the feet? It, 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 here he's saying, even the lowest part of the body becomes beautiful when it's attached to the messenger that is carrying the message, you are free and you are released. Uh, even the feet that is attached to the leg, that is attached to the torso, that is attached to the head, that is attached to the brain, thereby becoming that person that is out there carrying the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, even the lower parts of our body. The Bible says become beautiful when we are effectively communicating the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest news that Israel ever heard when they were in the Babylonian captivity was when God dispatched his messengers out to them and carried that message to them that they had been released that they had been set free from the bondage and the fetters of imprisonment and began to tell them, you are free now and released now to go back to Jerusalem with dancing and singing and praising and with joy in your heart and in your life. I don't know about you, but I would have liked to have been one of those messengers. Paul says to the debater, you've never heard Messengers came, you didn't know that? Why, it's flooded in your history. You say that they never showed up. Let me just tell you, just as God sent his messengers in your own history, so the coming of the Lord Jesus himself, God has always had his messengers. God would have absolutely never created a gospel for men, women, boys, and girls that sets them free from the uh, inhibitions of sin and with death, hell, and the grave to deliver them from that and not sent messengers out to tell them that they had been set free from the chains of sin. He would have never done that. I don't know about you, but I'm really grateful to God that God is still raising up and calling out preachers out of his own body and teachers and lay people. I'm still grateful to God that he's raising up messengers to send all over the world to announce to the world that they don't have to be in bondage to sin anymore because God has set them free, free through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what was Jesus' mission when he came to earth. Well, I'm glad you asked. Turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Luke and the fourth chapter, Luke chapter number four, and look with me, if you will, at verse 16. Luke chapter four <clears throat> and uh, verse 16. The Bible says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Here he goes. He's uh, giving us that Old Testament again, isn't he? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, now, that was the mission of the Lord Jesus. And then after three and a half years of his own personal ministry here on this earth, as he ascended back to the right hand of the throne of God, after his mission here, he lateraled that mission to the body of Christ. He gave us the task of doing exactly what he had been doing, and that was preaching and teaching and with authority, casting out demons 
and preaching the gospel of glad tidings. And he gave the authority to the body of Christ, to the church, and says to us, finish what I started. My wife and I were in Canada not too many uh, months ago. And uh, we were over there in Vancouver. And we didn't know where we were going, just kind of walking the streets. And so we asked for directions. Have you ever asked a Canadian for directions? Any Canadians in the house? I don't want to offend anybody, but you ever ask a Canadian for uh, directions? And you ask those for where you need to go and, and they will give you the directions. And as you're walking the way and getting ready to leave, they will say, carry on, carry on. When Jesus ascended back to the Father, he lateraled the mission uh, that he had been doing to the church and he says to the church, carry on, continue what I've been doing. You, you understand that the church is to walk into this sin-infested world and say that in Christ, you are now free. We are the, we are the messengers of Christ with that glorious message. I am convinced that the church needs to reclaim its authority in Christ. And when we find ourselves fighting again, by the way, can I just say this to you? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if families today would understand that we don't fight against flesh and blood, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness. And once we ever come to grips with the fact that flesh and blood is not our enemy, but our enemy is very sinister in its origin from the very pits of hell itself and comes on mission from Satan himself to attack the body of Christ. And once we understand who the real enemy is, then we can claim the authority that Christ has lateral to us and we can do battle. And I promise you, we would see God do some mighty things in healing and binding the hearts of people back together again. I'm also convinced of this, that if the church assumes its rightful authority, there'd be a lot of drug companies going out of business today that are writing almost 400,000 prescriptions a year to try to help people with anxiety disorders. I'm telling you, in Christ Jesus, we can take authority over oppression and depression and God can heal just like he did there. So we've been given that mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, don't tell me there are no messengers. Don't tell me they weren't there. You've had them in your own history and God still has them now. Now what's the second objection? Is the objection of the faulty message. Watch this in verse 16. I'm back in Romans now. In verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed your report? <clears throat> so the debater says, okay, all right, I give you this. Maybe the messengers did come, but there must be something wrong with the message. If, if the messengers came with the message and if Jews uh, still are disobeying the message, then the problem must be with the message. Boy, did they ever ask the wrong question to the wrong guy here in Paul. Paul says, you think the message was inadequate? Well, you Jews have been rejecting that message for centuries. And so he takes them back to Isaiah chapter 53, which gives us the picture of the suffering servant. When it says, who has believed our report? Who has accepted the message? The Jews didn't believe then, and they're not believing now. That's nothing new. Hist, Paul is saying history is just repeating itself. What's the reason behind that? It's not a faulty message, but they were faulty, not the message. Now, I, I wanna take just a minute. I wanna ask you to flip back with me to Isaiah chapter 28. Would you do that with me? Look with me to Isaiah chapter 28. I, I, powerful, if you, if you can, look on with somebody, if you don't have your Bible, and look on with somebody else, and go to verse seven. Isaiah chapter 28, and I want you to see verse seven. Now, Isaiah is uh, confronting a major problem in Judaism. 
And he's not talking about the ordinary person on the pew at this point. He's talking about the priests and what's wrong with the deliverer of the message. Now watch what he says. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. And the, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They're swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there's no place clean. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and the drawn from the breast, just the babies. And here's how you teach the babies. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not here. Hmm. This is the same problem that you've had for centuries, Paul says. A hundred times, no less than a hundred times in the 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah, he is describing the rebellion of the Jew toward God. It's not a problem with the message. The problem, Paul said, is with the hearers. Now, let me give you objection number three. It's the objection of the unheard message. Now, I'm back in Romans 10. Look at verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the debater says, well, maybe the messengers did come. And uh, yeah, well, okay, I'll give you this, Paul. Maybe there's nothing wrong with the messengers. They were good. But maybe the Jews didn't hear. Maybe the sound system was broken. Maybe the preacher wasn't loud enough that the people could not hear. There was something wrong with the volume of the message. Maybe they just didn't hear and they can't do anything about the message if they didn't hear the message. Paul says, don't hand me that. Uh, there's no excuse for them not hearing. I don't have time to take you back, but if you were to go back to the first chapter of the book of Romans in verses 19, 20, and 21, Paul says, let me just tell you, God has put enough in what he made and what he created that the hearers are without excuse. There's no excuse, he says, for people not to hear the message. Here, here's something to think about. Here's something to contemplate. People in America have heard the gospel message over and over and over and over again. Again and again and again. America has heard the message of Christ. I wonder though, do we have a right to hear it again and again when there's so many that haven't heard it somewhere else? Do we have a right to hear it a million times before somebody has a right to hear it one time? Verse 17 is a powerful verse. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now he's not talking about necessarily here the written word of God. The word that he's using there in 17 for word is the word rhema. It is a particular word. It is a specific word for a particular reason and a particular task, if you will. Paul's saying an amazing thing is that people come to salvation. Uh, people are changed. People are saved, not by sliding a gospel track under somebody's door, ringing the doorbell and running away. People are saved when the rhema, the living, verbal, breathing, hearing, sounding, animate message is spoken from my lips to their ears. 
I've often said that is mouth to ear resuscitation. People are saved and come to faith in Christ by a verbal message. You say, well, pastor, I'm not arguing that point. I, I, I know that you're right about that, but I feel so inadequate to be able to do that. Well, guess what? So do I. That has nothing to do with it. The fact of the matter is, you and I can memorize all of the outlines in the world. We can memorize every presentation that is produced about the gospel. And we may miss some of the outline and we may leave out some of the points. So what? The, the real issue is here is that we need to be giving a good word about Jesus wherever we may be, whether it's at the grocery store checking out our groceries or at the doctor's office ministering there. By the way, I sat the other day and talked to my Indian doctor and, and, and she had never heard the gospel. And for 45 minutes, she sat right there and just listened and soaked it all in. It's a matter of speaking a good word for Jesus wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing. That's the presentation. Sharing your faith. I, I love it when people get healed physically. I really do. We, I thank God. You know, we, we practice uh, what the book of James tells us. Is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church and let's lay hands. We do that here. And, and, and just this week, uh, I got a call. Pastor, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, thank you for, for the prayers because the doctor went in and did this test and they didn't find anything. And it was amazing to the doctor because he was certain that there was something there. But when we got there, it was gone. That's wonderful. But I want to tell you something. I thank God for it. But the greatest miracle that you and I will ever see in this side of eternity is when the grace of God overwhelms some old lost sinner somewhere and saves them by his grace and his mercy and changes their life in the power of the Holy Ghost. There's no greater miracle. Then let me give you the last. It's the objection of the misunderstood message. So the debater says, okay, Paul, I'll grant you the messengers came. I'll grant you that... Uh, the, 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 there was nothing wrong with the ears of the Jews and they heard and the message was good. But has it occurred to you that 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of the Jews just really didn't understand that it wasn't clear to them, that it was obscure to them, complicated and maybe too complex for them to, them to understand. Look at verse 19. But, but I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. You ought to underline that no people. That's really important in that text. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Paul is, I tell you, I would have never thought in a million years to answer the debate uh, with a passage out of Deuteronomy like Paul did. I would, I would have never been there. But Paul takes this debater back to Deuteronomy 32 verse 19. And God's telling the, the Jews, he says, y'all have made me so jealous. You've been chasing after other gods. You've set up these idols of worship out here. You've turned to everything in the world except to me. And my jealousy has created an anger in my heart toward you. And he says, because of that, just, just write it down somewhere in the, in the margin, Deuteronomy 32, go home and study. It said, because of that, this anger, I'm going to do to you the same thing that you have done to me. I'm going to make you jealous. And in your jealousy, you're going to get angry at me. And here's how I'm going to do it. Because you're going to reject the gospel. Because you're going to turn your back on the good news of Jesus. What he, my son has done for you, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to give the gospel to the people that you consider nothing but a bunch of dogs. Lower than life itself. Notice the term. I'm going to give my gospel to the no people. Hmm. 
Isn't that a strange turn of events? But that's what God says. And he adds one more thing now. Watch this. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not of me. He's saying, now wait a minute. You tell me that you don't understand the gospel. That's strange to me. Because when I take the gospel and I give it to the no people, the Gentiles, and I give it to the people that you despise, they understood it. And as a matter of fact, they weren't even looking for me, but they found me. They weren't seeking after me, but they discovered me. You tell me, too complicated for you? Well, what does that say about you? Too difficult for you, but they understood it. You figure it out. Where is the problem? Verse 21. Look this way just a minute before you read it. I have come to the conclusion that verse 21 is in all probability the greatest verse on grace in all of the New Testament. Maybe the Bible. Let's read together. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and a contrary people. Other versions say an unruly, obstinate, contrary, disobedient. What a picture of grace. Now, there are three things that jump out at me about this grace. First of all, I want you to see with me the duration of God's grace. He said, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands to a bunch of people that don't want me, that disobedient, they're unruly, they're contrary and they're obstinate about it. All day long, the duration. How many of you were ever in the military? Ever in the military? <clears throat> do you remember uh, one of the physical training exercises that we had to do? And I, I think it was across the board uh, in the military. You took your weapon and you held it like this. And you stretched out your arms. And God help you if you ever let it down. Do you remember that exercise? Shake your head like that. I remember. I want to tell you something. In just a matter of a short few minutes, you go to shake it. And your muscles begin to burn like they are on fire. The next day, your shoulders are so sore and inflamed that you can't stand it. You can only hold it out there for a little while. If you're tracking with me, men and women, say amen. See, they know what I'm talking about. They know what I'm talking about. Just a few minutes, just a few minutes. By the way, go home today. Don't even put anything in your hands. And just hold your arms out like that for a little while. Just see how long that you can do it. God's word says all day long. And I think it's a whole lot more than just 24 hours. I don't think he's talking about 24 hours here. All this time, he says, I've held out my arms. Won't you hear this message won't you yield to this message won't you come and let me forgive you won't you come and let me cover your sins with my son's precious blood and he, he extends that call and extends that call and extends that call and holds it out
Randy, I kind of have a little bit of recollection. Him holding his arms out to you for a long time. I have a little bit of recollection about the day you came running to him. I look out across this auditorium and I, I see a bunch of you sitting out here right now. God, for a very, very long time, held his arms out to you. You ran away. You said no. You rejected. You were unruly. But finally, you came. There's a bunch of you that are sitting out here today, right now. You're holding on to your sin. God's got his arms out. And he's saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. Yet you're disobedient and unruly. Contrary. There's another thing here. The substance of his grace. The substance of his grace. Notice he uses two pronouns in there. In verse 21, he says all day long, I have stretched out my hands. I'm going to tell you, grace doesn't come from us. Grace comes from God. He's the source. One final thing is the object of God's grace. Obstinate, contrary, inordinate, unruly people are the object of his grace. That means you. I don't care how deep in sin you've come. I don't care how far in sin you have stooped. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. God's grace is still extended to you for you to come so he can forgive you. Don't you listen to the lies of the devil that you've been too bad, that you're too deep in sin. God could never forgive you. It's not true. Look at what he says. I've extended my grace to you. I sure am glad he reached out to me, aren't you? Father, thank you for uh, this season, this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you're patient and you're long-suffering toward us. I, I thank you, Lord, that uh, there, there's no one in this room today with a desire in their heart that they have gone too far, too deep into sin that you can't reach down, Lord, and rescue them. Thank you, Lord, that you've sent me today as a messenger to let them know, Lord, that you will and you can save their soul and forgive their sin. Please get glory in this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name.